We've been having gremlins come into the building and adjust things. Can everybody hear me okay? I think it's this one. I have to work on it a little bit. I had a couple of, a couple of people say that they're having trouble hearing. So, um, but everybody hears me okay tonight, right? All right, good to see you uh, and for this midweek Bible study. We're going to be in 1 Kings in just a minute, chapter 2. You want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. That's where we'll get started. I just want to real quickly uh, go over just a few announcements. Number one, uh, please, if you haven't already, there are bulletins out in the foyer with good information in them uh, as far as the prayer request and announcements. Um, as a way of reminder that the Walk for Water event uh, that we're participating in is coming up, it's May 21st. Uh, if you haven't registered, there's uh, uh, still plenty of time to do that. You can go online. It's very easy to do. I just did that for our family uh, this past week. So um, if you haven't, do that. Uh, we did get several flyers, and I'll give these to Neil as well, and we can post them. But um, the, uh, this Saturday, uh, the Sheffield Drive Church of Christ in Rocky Mount is hosting their annual lectureship. And the flyer's up here. It begins, they have an early breakfast at 8, and then I think this is an interesting time to begin, but their first lesson is at 8.55. I find that very fascinating. Uh, I'm not quite sure why not 9, but hey. Anybody can do it Kind of different. There may, maybe so. People say I'm kind of psychological, or one, or something like that. Uh, I have psychosis, maybe. But uh, but there's that. Well, there is one posted out in the foyer. Also, and we've gotten several of these, and they're right on top of us. I don't. People aren't getting them in the mail as quickly, but. May 15th, Sunday, May 15th, South, so South Stokes Church of Christ in King, North Carolina is hosting a homecoming and Friends Day. Unfortunately, that's Sunday, so none of y'all can go, but I'll let you know about it. <laughs> uh, they're hosting that. Uh, that'll be posted up. And then also, um, on the 21st, um, the uh, Mountain Island Church of Christ and the University Church of Christ are hosting a uh, college and young, young adult summit uh, with, Mess, or with Wes McAdams. Uh, so uh, I'll put, post that as well. That's in Charlotte, uh, if anybody's interested in those. So those will be posted out there. And we also got a flyer from CBC. Uh, all this is happening like this coming next two weekends, but they're hosting a family summer camp uh, retreat weekend. May the 20th through the 22nd. Um, and so it's, uh, the cost is $50. If you're interested in taking your family, uh, you or your family to that, that'll be posted as well. A little bit of news there. But, um, um, but just keep those things in your mind on your prayers. Uh, you're in your prayers. In special... Uh, uh, um, Especially in your prayers, uh, we need to keep John uh, McMillan in our prayers, son of uh, Jackie and Sandra. Uh, from my discussions with Jackie, it seems like he's really he's starting to improve. He's not out of the woods by any means. He's still in ICU, but he has been moved up to the intermediate uh, area of the ICU. Um, there's still some concerns, of course, with his health and. Uh, there's some things they're going to have to deal with um, long term as well. So please keep them and your family as well as their daughter, daughter Karen, and her health struggles. Um, are there any others that we should be praying for? Uh, that I had a lady at work today, somebody I encountered at work, ask for prayers, and obviously God knows who she is and what she needs. I, uh, I cannot remember her first name even. Okay. Remember her. Anyone else? All right. Let's, uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Almighty God and Father above, we're so thankful that you love us and bless us in 
such a tremendous way. Father, we are uh, mindful uh, this evening of your word, of, of the uh, wonderful message of truth and grace and mercy that we uh, find uh, within the pages of our Bible, of your Bible. Father, we pray that as we study the, the life of David and Solomon and the many others uh, surrounding them, we pray, Father, that you'll bless our study, that you'll bless our hearts as we uh, consider uh, more deeply your truth. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, uh, what we talk about are, are things that will touch our hearts and our minds, that will motivate us to, uh, to do uh, what you're calling us to do. Uh, Father, we're so thankful for, uh, for the blessing of being able to join together in a Bible study like this. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll bless each person here. Father, we're also mindful of the many works you have going on here in Sanford and in the lives of, of these Christians, as well as uh, the many churches uh, throughout our country and our world. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless the church, you continue to especially bless us here in Sanford. Uh, Father, um, we are also mindful of, of the McMillan family and, and the struggles they are facing. We're so thankful for the blessings they have received. Um, Father, we pray that you continue to bless them and be with them. And uh, of most importance, Father, we pray for their eternal souls and, and just pray, Father, that the gospel will, will reach their hearts. Father, we're also mindful of, uh, of the individual that uh, Tori met today. We, uh, we may not know her name or situation, but we know you do. And, and Father, we, all, um, we ask that you please be with, uh, be with her and bless her Father. Father, again, uh, it's such a wonderful blessing to be before you. Uh, we pray, Father, that you continue to bless us. Um, Father, um, also mindful of, of uh, Patrick and, and um, uh, him dealing with uh, COVID. Uh, pray for him and Sandy as he recovers. Again, Father, thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that I offer this prayer. Amen. I knew I forgot one as I found out Patrick uh, uh, has COVID. Uh, they found out uh, he's doing okay, but uh, he was feeling down a little bit. Uh, I know earlier in the week, uh, um, but I think he's starting to do better. He's gotten some medications that have helped him uh, begin to recover. So if you remember Patrick and Sandy, uh, as they're away from us and as he's dealing with this. Um, so, uh, let's jump into our study tonight. Um, we are, is that active? Sorry. Thank you. No problem. So uh, we've been looking at this transitional period from, from the reign of David, and we've been moving into now the reign of Solomon. We're going to continue our thoughts. We, we looked at chapter 1 of 1 Kings um, in our last class. We're going to move on into chapter 2 this evening in just a minute. Um, as we think about uh, what we studied last week, we, we talked about Adonijah and, and, and his attempt at rebellion, or I don't even know if you consider it rebellion, but his, his, his attempt at making himself king, and that didn't work out, of course, very well for him. Um, we, we discussed how how that, that promise had been made from David and really ultimately God that Solomon would be the next king. And so uh, that kind of spurs on the, est the establishment of, of Solomon's uh, kingship. And then as we, uh, we were discussing at the end of our class was David was preparing Solomon for this tremendous responsibility that now has been laid on his shoulders. And, and, and as he... <laughs> is uh, preparing to become king. David has some, some advice, and then he has some requests, and that's what we're going to start at next week. So I hope, I mean, sorry, this week. I hope you've had a chance to read through the text and think about it. Um, but as we do, um, a few things that we're going to look at in this study is David. Uh, we're going to continue that, that thought of David prefer, preparing Solomon to be king. And then we'll get kind of, we, we get to the uh, bookmark, right? The, the, the passing of David from this life. It really ends a, um, um, 
a good period for Israel with some things in it that were negative. But David, uh, David was a good king. And so we'll have some thoughts to share about that. And then, of course, then Solomon's reign uh, really begins. Uh, his reign is established through some actions that, that he's going to do uh, as he um, sets him, you know, as he takes the reins of, of, of being king. Uh, we will read about uh, um, one of the first requests of Solomon, and that's actually something spurred on by God himself. And he's going to come and ask Solomon for some, uh, you know, for a blessing uh, from him. And Solomon's going to ask for wisdom, and we'll see that. And right away we'll see how that prayer is answered and how that prayer, how this new gift is going to be tested. And so uh, that's where we hope to get this evening. Um, so let's go to chapter 2, and we're going to continue our thoughts. I'm going to quickly review a little bit of what we've talked about. But... Uh, verse 1 tells us that David's time, his, his end has come. Now, I think it's interesting, and, and I would advise you to take some time and read through not only 1 Kings, but Chronicles as well. Chronicles is a great pair with 1 Kings. There's some information that you get in Chronicles that you don't in 1 Kings, and I'll share some of those things with you as I go. I won't be able to show, share everything, but uh, I, would, I would read those. Um, it's 1 Kings about verse uh, chapter 20 and on will we'll match up to kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, so I do advise you to go back. So they don't line up like 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and 1 Kings chapter 1 are talking about different things. So you kind of have to figure out where they line up. But uh, I believe it's about chapter 19 or 20 where you begin to read about Solomon and, uh, and, and the end of David's king. Uh, David being king and Solomon beginning his reign. Uh, but I will allude to those things from time to time. So uh, chapter 2, so it says his time to die has come near. Uh, he knows that. He realizes it. We noted in our last study how David at this point appears, from my understanding of the, of the text, is he's almost bedridden at this time, or, or what would you call it? Um, maybe not bedridden is not the right term, but... He's, he's, he, he's at that point in his life where he's not getting up and moving around a lot anymore. Um, and so uh, he then brings uh, Solomon to himself. In verse 2, uh, he reminds him of the covenant that he, David, had with God. And he says, it's the same covenant God will have with you, which is what? Okay, you keep my commandments, you, uh, there will be a king, uh, a uh, son of David on the throne. You may want to add to that. What, 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 was in, what was a part of this covenant? What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and, and that's going to be, of course, tested over time. But as long as they're faithful to God... God will, God will bless them. So if we were to break it down into a very bare kind of summary, it's if you're faithful, I'll bless you. If you're unfaithful, I'll remove my blessing. And so um, uh, David shares it with Solomon. He says, God makes the same covenant with you. Be strong and show yourself a man keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses. I think it's an important phrase there, as it's written, because there's going to be some kings later on who are going to be like, well, what if I rewrite the law? And they're going to try to rewrite some things that they shouldn't be. Um, and, and so he says that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. And so uh, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your son pays close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack for a man on the throne of Israel. And so, so long as that's true, God will keep his blessing to him. Now, that's going to be tested um, and pretty soon. All right. 
So uh, let's go on uh, verse 5. So David says, I want you, this, this ought to be the, the, the motto of your kingship. Verses 1 through 4. And so uh, verse 5, he says, Moreover, I think I jumped ahead there. Let me do that. Moreover, you also know what Joab the son... Okay, so now, so 1 through 4, David's advice. 5 and on are some requests that David's going to make of Solomon. Now notice, number 1, he's going he's to talk about Joab. Now, before we get into that, who's Joab? Just a brief summary. Who is he? Okay, captain of the army. What'd you say? Yeah, so he's the commander of the army. He's um, he's been with David. I mean, uh, with David for a long time, hadn't he? Uh, he was with David uh, for a while now, since before he was king, and and, and so he's a very powerful man. All right. So David says, moreover, you also know what Joab, the son of Zeruah, uh, did to me. How he dealt with the two. And notice what he says, what he did to me. Now what you're going to notice is, Joab didn't physically do anything to David, but notice what he says. Um, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether. Now, real quickly, uh, who's Abner? Who was Abner? Who's caretaker? Yeah, Meshubaseth was Jonathan's son. So that wasn't Abner. That was, um, oh, <laughs> it was, um, starts with a Z. It wasn't Zeruah. Um, oh, it was the guy that found Meshibosheth and brought him to David. I'll have to look that up for you. I'm sorry. I can't remember his name. But Abner was the commander of Saul's army. Remember, Abner was Saul's man. Now, Remember what happened with Abner? When David began to win against Saul, what happened with Abner? Remember Saul, uh, basically, uh, Abner had been very faithful to Saul, and Saul's losing, and he begins to blame Abner. And he says some things to Abner that are, you know, um, that made Abner mad. And so what does Abner do? He goes over to David. He says, I'll come over here to you. Do you remember what David said to him? He made a peace compact with him. That if, if, he, if he's faithful, David will accept him. Okay, just keep that in mind. We'll come back to that in just a second. So that's Abner. What about Amasa? Who's Amasa? He was the commander of whose army? Absalom. Remember when Absalom's rebellion happened? Who did Absalom put in charge of his armies? Amasa. Very similar situation. David makes a peace compact with Amasa. He even goes as far as say, Amasa, I'm going to replace Joab and I'm going to put you as commander over my armies. Now this is after David's, uh, you know, uh, Absalom's been killed. Um, you don't know what's going to happen with Amasa. And, and David says, you're going to be commander. Or maybe, I, I don't remember if Absalom was dead yet, but it, it is all during that period of time. So David makes two peace compacts. Well, what happened in both situations? Now notice as you continue reading, uh, he says, Amasa the son of Jether, verse 5, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace, for blood that had been shed in war, 
putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals on the sandals on his feet. Now we were kind of talking about this last week, but Joab was a man of war, but he was also a vengeful man. Now you remember Abner killed his brother. Remember the, the, they had come out, you had um, Abner with, with the men of Saul, you had Joab with the men of David. They were out there and they started fighting one another and they were chasing each other around. And Abner told, what is his name? Somebody get his name. But he told the young man, he said, stop chasing me. He didn't. Well, they battled. Abner killed him. And Joab um, didn't initially do anything to Abner. But later on, after David had made a peace compact, he took his vengeance out on Abner and killed him. Well, what about Amasa? What happened with Amasa? David makes a peace compact, and what does he do? He finds Amasa out on the road, and he kills him. Remember, he leaves him out on the road to bleed out there. Eventually, they pull him off into the woods or whatever, out of the way, and he, he killed him. Right? Now, David doesn't even mention it, but he also killed Absalom. Now, the difference there is they're in the middle of war, and David probably shouldn't have asked for that to start with, but... He did, and, jo and Joab didn't listen. But he doesn't even bring that up. He does bring up those two. And David says, he killed them in the time of peace, not in the time of war. And um, uh, you want to go back and look at that. I don't know if I have these up here on the board, but uh, I don't. But um, you, you want to read more about Abner, you can go back to 2 Samuel chapter 3. 27, and then later on, 2 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 10, you can read about his killing of Amasa. That's where those two references come from. And again, David doesn't mention it, but just to recall to mind, he also killed Absalom, and you can read about that in 2 Samuel 18, 5 and following. And so he's got a lot of blood on his hands. And not just blood from war, but even just out of vengeance. Quite honestly, he murdered those two men. And um, later on in this chapter, I don't have this, I'm trying to decide whether to, He'll get more into this, and we'll come back to this later in verse 32, but hold on to that. Let's go on to verse 6. So David reminds him about what happened, and then notice verse 6. He says, act therefore according to your wisdom. All right, so he, he leaves it up to Solomon. He doesn't tell Solomon, you need to do this, but I have a request. But do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol, a, uh, to Sheol in peace. What's, what's David saying? You need to bring justice against him. He's a murderer. David accused him of two murders, which he committed. And what's the judgment for murder? Well, a life for a life. That's even the law. Of, I mean, that's the law of Moses, isn't it? Blood for blood. Um, and, and so David says, do not let his... Uh, let him go down in death in peace, but bring justice. That's basically what he's saying. Sheol, interesting term. That's the same term later on where we get the term Hades from. Uh, Sheol is not hell. He's talking about the grave. So he's basically talking about death, right? Um, and so he says don't do that. So that's the first request. Number two. Any questions about that before I move on? I know it's a lot. Okay, so he's going to make his second request. Uh, he says in verse 7, But deal loyally with the sons of Barzilla, the Gildalite, uh, Gil Gileadite. So who is Barzilla? Y'all remember his, what happened with him? Exactly. He, he helped nourish David and his people. He gave them protection and food 
Uh, he did a lot of good for him. You remember when David returns to Jerusalem, David asked Barzilla to come, to come with him, and he says, no, I don't want to do that. I'm an old man. Let me go home, be with my people, but you can take my son with you, and David does that. However, um, uh, David here has a different request. He says, verse 7, let them be among those who eat at your table. Now, there's significance to that. What is it? He doesn't just say, let him live in Jerusalem. Don't, don't uh, just let him live in peace. But he says, let him eat at your table. What's he indicating by that? You let anybody eat at your table? Are you a little bit guarded about who you let in your house? Doesn't it say something about the people you invite into your home? Yeah, and it really meant something to David. You remember this is the same with, um, with Jonathan's son, Mishosheth, right? Mishosheth, one of the things David did to try to repay the, his debt of faithfulness to, that he had toward Jonathan, he brings uh, Mishosheth, he lets him eat at his own table to eat with the king really meant something. And so he says, you need to uh, please treat them well. I don't say you need to, but he says, please treat them well. Um, Let them be among those who eat at your table, for with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. You can go back to 2 Samuel 17 to read about that later uh, in that chapter, verse 27 and following. Um, so there's Barcilla. So he has a, po- a negative request and a positive request. And then verse 8. He has a couple more negative ones. Uh, a couple more just, justice dealings that, that he wants uh, to be done. All right, verse 8. There's also um, with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, from Barum, or ba- Barum who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day I went to uh, Mahananim. Who is, who is this guy? Who's Shimei? Do you remember him? Remember reading about that? He was the guy that cursed David because he was the father of Saul. Second Samuel chapter 16, he's the guy that was throwing rocks and cursing David. Kept cursing him as he was leaving. Remember, one of his soldiers said, Let, let's just cut his head off. Let's kill him right now. David says, don't. Let him be. This is, the, this is God working through him. Interesting kind of phraseology by David. He says, let him alone. If, if, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he says, if I'm to be cursed by God, I'll be cursed. But if not, let, let this stand as proof. So, uh, he's cursing David as he leaves, but then later on, when David comes home in 2 Samuel 19, what's Shemai doing? <laughs> he comes out asking for mercy, right? And don't hold this against me, please. And that, what's David's response? If you just summarize it. He says, I, I'm not, I'm, I won't. Right, and so David shows him mercy again. One of his soldiers says, "Let's kill him now. Now we definitely can kill him." Right? David says, "No, don't do that. Let him be. Let him live at peace." David will remind Solomon of that as well. Um, he says, "But um, um, later in verse eight, he says, uh, but when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword.'" Right, so David says, I'm not going to do that. And so he's allowed to live there. However, verse 9, David says, I, very important, very important pronoun, I will not put you to death by the sword. But notice what he says. Uh, verse 9, now therefore do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. This is even before he asked for wisdom, by the way. You will know what you ought to do to him. So David basically, just like he said with Joab, he says, you do as you see fit. But let me just give you what I think ought to happen. And so he goes on to say, and you shall bring 
Uh, and you shall bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. So he says, I know you're wise. You're going to know what to do, and you're not going to let him go to, go to death in peace. And so again, uh, David sees the justice finally given to him is that he is pronounced punishable by death. Um, and he's true to his word. David's not going to be the one to pass judgment. He will let Solomon do that. Most likely, all those scriptures would say, when they went to kill him, they would rehearse to him why it was that he was dying. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, here you are. You, know, you have done this wickedness in your life, and now you're being paid restitution. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so David has those few very simple requests. You know, um, and and so he he gives Solomon some wisdom there. I said two. I meant one. There are two total requests that he asked for justice, uh, which is with Shimei and Joab, and then he asked for blessings on Barcilla. So, so now as we've noted, and it's been kind of the the writer, the author here has been kind of cluing us in to David now. It's getting near the end. Uh, we're not sure how long it's been this process, but we know, do know a little bit about how long he served. Um, let's go to Second King, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 10. It's, the text tells us, Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Where's that at? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Interestingly enough, it's also the place of what? The death of David, but the birth, birthplace of Jesus. Um, he slept with his fathers uh, and was buried in the city of David. Uh, and, at, and the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33, another just interesting kind of fact, 33 years in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know for sure how long Jesus lived. We've estimated that it was about 33 years. Just interesting parallels. You can't make any more out of it, but it is interesting. Uh, interesting coincidences. Now, the death of David in Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem is not just a coincidence. There is foresight in God in that, because later on, it will be pro prophesied about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. That all is planned out by God. And very important. I think it's also interesting um, that this is one of those uh, these um, ideas of David being buried in, in, uh, in Bethlehem, of uh, being buried in the grave that Peter will use as illustrations in his message in Acts chapter 2. He will compare David to Jesus. And you know, uh, David's dead. You know where his tomb is. Jesus is not in his tomb. Jesus is better than David. Um, so, just interesting. Um, Chronicles gives us uh, a little bit more information. Um, well, kind of the same information, but it gives us kind of a summary here of the life of, of David. First uh, Chronicles 29, beginning at verse 26. Thus David, the son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel... That's also a pretty significant. Um, David and then Solomon will be the last kings to reign over a united Israel. Now we've already noted that you've already began to see division growing in the country and that will only get worse as you move forward. A division is coming. Well, David reigned over a united Israel um, Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse uh, 27. The time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. Then he died at a good age, full of days, riches, and honor. And, his son, and Solomon, his son, reigned in his place. Very different uh, biography or obituary than Saul, right? Um, and one of the things we've done in this class was is try to compare those two kings and how different they were. Um, 
And even here at the end, you see a very different end to both men. Uh, King Saul, how did he die? Killed by a possible suicide. Uh, at least requested suicide. Um, he had some help in that, probably. Um, and died as a defeated king on the battlefield. David died at peace. What? Yes. And maybe he cut his limbs off as well. I can't remember. I need to go back and reread that. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Roger. Uh, what makes you say that? Well, there's definitely a part of Jerusalem that's considered the city of David. And then, you know, I, I remember, you know, that they had the grave of David when it was in Jerusalem when I was there. And uh, I'll go back and look that up. I, I honestly don't know the, the answer to that question. I, I've I assumed it was in Bethlehem, but, but it's something I need to look at. Um, because Bethlehem's called the city of David. But I have to go back and look at my geography. and Maybe I'm messing something up. But I'll, I'll check into that. Good question, though. Anybody, anybody else have information on that? <laughs> maybe help the rest of us out. I've always associated those two in my mind. I've never heard associated any other place in, in Jerusalem with the city of David. But Bethlehem's not far from Jerusalem. So, um, so I, I'll put some thought into that and look that up. Good question. Any others? So um, if we go back to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 12 says, Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and, the king, and his kingdom was firmly established. In, in all, you really have a pretty smooth transition uh, from, from one king to that, especially when you compare it to the last one, right? From Saul to David, that was a very messy process. This was a very smooth process. Now, this will be the last real smooth one. Um, well, depending on how you look at it. Um, but... Uh, you, um, when we get to Rehoboam, things will be a little different. Uh, but now you have Solomon beginning his reign over Israel. And so um, I want to go to First Chronicles chapter, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 1. So as you get into Second Chronicles and you begin to read about the reign of Solomon... Uh, verse 1 says that Solomon, the son of David, established himself in, the king, in, the, in his kingdom, and the, Lord was, and the Lord his God, very important, was with him and made him exceedingly great. Man, Solomon, in the beginning of his reign, was a powerful king for Israel. During his reign, he brought peace. You remember David, the reason God said you cannot build my temple was why? Do you remember why? You're a man of war. There's blood on your hands. But your son Solomon, he's going to be able to build it. Because he's not going to be a king of war. He's going to be a king of peace. And so he begins um, uh, his reign very well. Uh, again, the text there, you can't underestimate and the Lord his God was with him. Um, and so a powerful statement. You go on later as you continue reading. Um, Sol Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges, to all the leaders of, in all Israel, the heads of his father's house. And Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the uh, high places uh, at uh, Gibeon for the tent of meeting of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made, made in the wilderness, was there. Now notice that. Where at this point 
is the Ark of the Covenant. It's in Jerusalem. <laughs> Where's the tabernacle? In Gibeon. Uh, that's not good, is it? Now, he, he will bring those two together in the temple, but you start asking, why does Israel have some problems at times? Well, it's because they mess these things up. So they, they've come together at Gibeon. Uh, uh, there at the tent of meeting. Um, verse 4, David, and verse 4 clues us in to where the ark is. David had brought the ark of God to Kirith uh, uh, Jerem to the place that David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. So it's in a tent. Uh, I think it's interesting. They're, they're, <laughs> it's not the proper tent for it, it's not the tabernacle. Uh, but here you have uh, the tabernacle. Just interesting to me. Moreover, the bronze altar of Bezele, um, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, Her, um, may, w had made, was uh, there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out. And Solomon went up, uh, went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which is at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Now, I think the indication that he offered it does not necessarily indicate that he personally offered it, but that he ordered it to be offered. Who is to offer the sacrifice? The high priest, not the king. That's what got Solomon in trouble. So I think when you read that, it may, may kind of confuse us and think, oh, was, Sol was Solomon offering sacrifice? No. Um, I think the, the proper indication there is that it was ordered to be done. So uh, I think it's also interesting to think about as soon as he becomes king, we don't know how long it is, but it's not too long after being established as king, that what does he do? He offers sacrifice. I can't help but think about Noah. What was the very first thing Noah did when he got off the ark? He built an altar to offer sacrifice to God. Right? And so you have um, examples of men throughout Scripture when God would do something, one of the first things they would do was to praise God. And I think it was important that Solomon keep that um, proper mental focus. All right. Uh, I don't want to get into to this um, to this particular portion because I have one minute. <laughs> but next week, so David made some requests. What does Solomon do with it? We're going to find out. Uh, Solomon's going to bring some justice uh, to some people, and uh, it's not going to go well for them. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Any questions or comments? Thank y'all. We'll be dismissed and rejoined for devotional in just a few minutes.